Here's what people need to do, like today. Find a dark space. Find a place in your office with a whiteboard. Take the whiteboard, write at the top of it, revenue. And I want you to literally spend an hour alone in silence. And I want you to write out all the different ways that you know how to make money in this business. And then what I'd like you to do from there is to circle and highlight a few that you're attracted to, figure out which ones are easy to implement and maybe you've missed, and start developing yourself in those two to three areas immediately. All right, you guys, welcome back to the Light It Up podcast. If you're new to the channel and you wanna know everything there is about making money in real estate, selling sales skills, building your business or investing, then subscribe below, tap the bell for notifications so you can be the first to know what makes our great guests so successful. Let's talk about adding leverage. So we've been getting a lot of calls of people asking us how we've hired virtual assistants to scale and leverage our business. So we've opened up our playbook to all of you. If you're looking to add leverage in your business, whether it's administrative support, ISA outbound callers, go to adleverage.com and they'll be there to help you staffing your team. All right, guys, excited about today's guest. We have with us David Van Noy. David was uh, my first real estate coach. I know he coached Kiro for years. Yep. And uh, we're starting to do more of more of these in-person uh, interviews. So excited to uh, excited to have That's you great. Here. I'm in Jersey. I'm in like a box somewhere. Yeah. I don't know if I'm ever going to leave. If I never come out of we'll here, never see him again. Yeah, uh, I, I, it's been real though. The pizza was amazing. We went to a great spot today. Yeah, man. And I feel like I've lived my life. So if, if this is it, I've enjoyed it so far. I'm low key jealous that you hit him up for lunch and not me, but it's all right. Well, I mean, there's you reason. got the Italian vibes. You're right? taking me out tonight. Yeah. 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 Well, um, the purpose that David's here is. Yeah. Because, why am I here? Yeah, so David is one of the best sales coaches that we've I've had the exposure to. And one of the things that David's really good at is taking an agent who's a solo agent doing 20, 30 deals a year and doubling their business, um, not only by making them think differently, but ultimately by thinking bigger. And that's 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 one of the things that we appreciate about you. And that's why you're here. I appreciate you saying it like that. You know, I was having this conversation with a, one of the guys that I've worked with recently, and he said something to me that actually made a lot of sense to me. He said, you are a belief coach. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about it like that, right? Because when I've worked with people like, like you guys, both individually in the past and at different parts in your careers, because you guys have done amazing things since then, one thing that is pretty consistent is I actually really do have an incredibly high level of belief in a lot of the people that I coach. One of the reasons that I couldn't stay a coach for a national organization was I didn't believe in every single person I was coaching. Mm. And so I, now I get to select the ones that I work with and I actually have it. So he said, you're a belief coach. And I thought that like, it, it makes me feel like complete alignment. Yeah. Like that's exactly what I'm here to do yeah. is get people to see what's possible for themselves because that's all I'm trying to do for myself, right? So that's yeah. all it is when I'm coaching someone on that, all I'm doing is teaching myself. Yeah, one of the, I think the biggest distinction too is that you're almost investing your name and your reputation on that person that you're coaching. So it's like, it's it's different to do it for yeah. like a service, but then to be like, no, I'm gonna pour in you because you're gonna do it and then we're gonna win-win together. I think that's a different shift into instead of like majority of coaches. Yeah, And I, I think back like when you were coaching me, this was probably five years ago, when I was f first hired a coach, you were really good about not really knowing enough about like my personal life and my family, but knowing just enough. Like, I feel like sometimes if coaches know too much, then like you get off topic and you get off focus. And like your job is not to know all of my personal stuff, right? It's just to know just enough. So you would sort of weave in certain things, but not be too involved. That's interesting that you say it like that. Cause I was working with someone today when yeah. I, cause I was at another real estate office today yeah. and I was dealing with someone on the team and I was asking her about her position with the company yeah. and she was trying yeah. to explain to me the job that she does. And I said, are you the firstborn or the second born? And she said the second. And mm. I said, you have an older brother? And she said, yes. I said, your father, was he like this? And your mother was like this, right? Now, you guys know me. I don't get too involved in people's personal lives yeah. necessarily unless it's a huge problem mm -hmm. and it's affecting production. But we went through some of that and we determined that she was born in chaos, basically. And it causes her to take on a lot of energy from people around her. Mm. Because when you're young and you take on chaos, 
then yeah. your brain is wired to basically see that pattern recognition everywhere you go. And so when you're in like a sales manager position, as an example, it's like you're an empath. And so every single person's problem becomes your problem. Yeah. And then everything every single day is like chaos to you. Yeah. And she's completely out of sync, you know, with what she should be doing. Yeah. yeah. In my mind, I remember we were talking about mirroring and matching a while back, right? Yeah. I'm on our, our coaching calls. And I kept saying it sucks. And you're like, so who's Kiro? And I'm like, I, I don't know, I'm a mirror. And you're, you're like, nope, that's the wrong answer, right? It's because I was being too empathetic to the situation that that person would throw on me. And it's like seller would be sold. The client or the prospect was sometimes selling me more than I was selling them. So that was like something that stood out, which helped me gain power back. So that was like a very big moment when you were coaching me that helped me understand the difference between being empathetic and being understanding what they're going through, but then still moving forward because there's a situation there and a problem that needs to be solved. This is interesting because we haven't really talked about this at length, but it, especially in coaching you because you're so versatile, mm -hmm. what I recognize with you is that you would constantly take mirroring and matching and turn that into being a chameleon mm -hmm. as opposed to being yourself and then actually mirroring and matching their experience, not the person. Yeah. Mirroring and matching the enthusiasm, not the disposition. Mm -hmm. Because when you're trying to pretend like you're someone that you're not, people can smell that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you're just talking to people the way that they talk, if I were to talk to someone like in Jersey, like I was talking to these ladies today, <laughs> and, right? Yeah. And if I talk to her in a, in a similar vernacular, she's like, yeah. I was on a listing appointment with this guy, right? And I went to close the listing and asked him, and he said, are you from Jordan? Mm. He said this to me. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, what? From Jordan? Yeah. He goes, you from Jordan? I go, mm. dude, I've never been anywhere. Like, yeah. I'm from Kansas City. I've yeah. never, what do you mean <laughs> am I from Jordan? He goes, you're, you're like, that's just how you sound. Like, yeah. that to me was mirroring and matching, right? Mm. I don't know anything about that, but when I was really connected with him on the presentation he felt like i was from his hometown really yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow i yeah. just i just think that's absolute yeah yeah right where you should be as a salesperson yeah no yeah. that's beautiful that's and it's so true because like when you are hungry to learn something new and new skills right there's certain ways that it can work to not benefit you and there's certain ways it's like the right amount yeah, you take it too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that's that was so. Yeah, I'm grateful for you for that. That was that was definitely a learning moment. That's <laughs> yeah. for sure. Take it too far, <laughs> uh, all the time. Yeah, I, I always call myself a chameleon because whatever situation I'd be in, I'm literally mirroring. Like if they're like sad, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Then I'm down like one line instead of being sympathetic to the situation and yeah. be like, here's the solutions. I'm like sad with them. <laughs> yeah. Right. If I'm talking to an expired, you would always say like, be mad with them, not mad at them. Mm. So like if they're laughing hysterically, cursing, just be with them in the same situation, but solve problems, like go towards the sale process to meet with them. Cause that's the purpose of the call, uh, like the whole phone call from the beginning. From a prospecting standpoint, what's hard for people to realize is that they can, there's a time on the call mm -hmm. when you shift yourself to their side, when it's actually you and them versus the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, and that's exactly when that happens is when they're considering taking on your energy, if you will. And once that happens and you say, I can't believe that that's what happened to you. And this is just something that we see quite often, mm -hmm. whatever that is, and then they shift and you say, you know, here's what everybody else in the world is doing differently. Here's what you and I are going to do. Yeah. And they take on that energy. That's- That's huge. Yeah. yeah. There's the beads you have. I think you like are so fundamental with the B part. That's like the, the person that you have to be in the role more than anything else and becoming that, fulfilling it. Because a lot of our calls too are about like exercise, wellness, yeah. fitness, and stuff like that. You're like, go do, uh, what is it called? Like 25 KJs on the, uh, <laughs> the, the, whatever it's called. And you're like, send me a picture. And I couldn't, or 200, you wanted me to do a day. That was hard, but. You know, I was confined a lot by the coaching where people thought it was supposed to be about certain things. Mm -hmm. The good thing about coaching is people sign up, they pay the money, they're kind of required to give it a shot. If you don't have that accountability, it's almost impossible. Yeah. But when someone, almost inevitably, when somebody comes in and decides they want to be a coaching client, we address their physical nature first. Yeah. Because you cannot be successful in your life if you don't at least engage yourself physically on a regular basis. Yeah. yeah. They find that kind of strange sometimes, but I'll take on a new coaching client and we'll say, okay, how many times a week are you working out? Like 
what? I thought we were going to talk about scripts and role play. Mm. Like this is everything though, right? Yeah. Mm. It's everything. If you're yeah. not doing everything you can to be ready for that, it's all energy. Like we have prospecting at my office every single morning. Everybody comes in around eight, 8.30 latest, 8.48 is the huddle. Mm -hmm. Well, from eight o'clock when I get there until 8.48, you can feel the mm. music rise. Oh, like we it. just did that before we got, right? Yeah. I was like, where's the music at? We gotta get the music going, right? And you got the- Big booty mix. Big booty mix. <laughs> <laughs> and in the yeah. office, you can hear, it starts out lo-fi. Mm. Mm. Right? The goes. Yeah, and then by the time, it's 848 ready for the huddle mm. and the and there's literally on Sonos it goes ding dong ding dong and it's like Pavlov's dog that <laughs> <laughs> towards the prospecting stations yeah and, but then we hit Metallica right there like, yeah. that's you're intentional about every minute of the day from the like the income producing hours so that's 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 a nerdy way to say it yeah. that's yeah. not what <laughs> yeah. it's a buildup of the energy to make sure that it's like people are intentional about the activities that they're doing it's, it's about controlling your environment. It's about yeah. controlling your mindset, controlling the energy, and being very purposeful all the way up until you make the first call. Because mm -hmm. how hard is it to walk into an empty office by yourself and muster the energy to make calls? The last thing you wanna do, yeah. yeah. It's tough. It's tough. But if you get a couple people around you all of a sudden that wanna do it as well, you get the same mindset, you get the right lighting, you get the right music, you mm. get the yeah. coffee's hot, everybody's excited, like let's hit it. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So Vannoy was your first coach. What was your, what were you Is that right? before? My first real estate coach, yeah. What, were you, what was your production level before? What was it after? I think we were talking about this before. I think I did 25 transactions uh, on my own without a coach. And then, uh, and that was mostly like COI, past clients. I did a lot of rentals, so it was converting like people who had rented from me in the past into first time buyers. Mm. And then uh, once I signed up for coaching and David and I worked together, I, I was able to double my business, go from 25 to 50. And not only that, but make it, probably the important part is make it more profitable, right? So we went over a lot of stuff that was like, you know, hey, if you're you know, charging a 6% commission, you don't always have to give out half, right? If your market, you know, the average commission out to buyers agents is two and a half percent or 2.25, whatever it is, you know, it's okay to keep three and a half or 3.75, whatever that ends up being, you know, it's okay to charge the seller a transaction fee, mm. right? So my business not only doubled, but it went from being, you know, whatever the profit margins were, they, they increased by a lot. I've received a lot of flack in my market for that practice, actually. Now, I can have a Jersey guy stagger a Cobroke and it's no big, nobody is gonna get that upset about it. Yeah. Mm. In Kansas City, where I was just trying to be profitable as a listing agent, doing the same work that you do, yeah. I would offer a two and a half percent commission to the buy side for a lot. I don't anymore because, well, I started my own company a year ago and it just made sense as a company that we get away from that. Mm. But as an individual listing agent, there's no reason not to do that because you're just trying to protect the dollar. And I, I wasn't necessarily yeah. trying to cooperate that I was trying to dominate. Yeah. And there's a difference. I think as long as you're not putting the seller at a disadvantage and offering out 2% when the whole market's offering out two and a half or three, as long as you're in line with the competition or if not slightly above, then. Well, that's an interesting segue. So do you think that the seller's at a disadvantage based on the buyer's compensation? This is actually in the news a lot right now. No. Do I think no, but do I think someone could argue that or see it differently? Yes. Yeah, but let me sharpshoot it a little further. Let's go a little yeah. further on it because I think this is a point that's in the news a lot and agents mm -hmm. are talking a lot about There's this and trying to get this stuff. figured out. I'm genuinely curious about what you think about this part. If you put a property on the market right now in your market and it's a good house, price right, and you offer zero dollars compensation, zero. It will sell. It will sell. Mm -hmm. Do you think it will sell? Yeah. Because, you know, there's a lawsuit that was just recently won on this that came out of Missouri, where I live, where they sued real estate companies and won, right? They won $1.8 billion mm -hmm. because they said in the lawsuit, and I'm just giving you the layman's version of the lawsuit, right? I'm not an attorney, but it affects the real estate business a lot because what they said was, that real estate companies have been colluding mm. to protect buyer's agency fees, right? And so what they've said is, and it's kind of it's true, right? Because 
when you guys got into real estate, when I got into real estate, you were just told that a buyer agent got a 3% fee, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That was just widely accepted. You didn't make that up. You didn't get with the seller and decide what was right. right. So it has been protected, right? Well, as far as the government is concerned, that's called antitrust. Because if you drive down the street and there's two gas stations and they both decide that gas is now $30, mm -hmm. yeah. that's against the law. Right. Right. But so what they did in this lawsuit is they came back and said, yeah, these these companies are guilty. They owe the plaintiffs one point eight billion dollars. It's what's called a treble case, which means it's multiplied by three treble damages. Yeah, mm. That's right. Treble damages. And that's a really big deal. So you mentioned that a property will sell anyways without buyer agency. So should there be buyer's agents at all? There should be. Well, I think there's a definition issue because in the past it used to be a co-broking agent, right? A co-broke. But when they switch it over to a buyer agent, it's like now it kind of sounded like it was colluding. It's like the person who assists with the sale by identifying a buyer gets compensated. But now it's like buyer's agent, seller's agent. So now it sounds like they're against each other and now it's like the collusion starts there. Well, it's true well, though, right? Because, I mean, I'm playing devil's advocate on this, but if I'm the seller, I'm offering a 6% commission total. I'm going to pay 3%. Mm -hmm. to a, a cooperating agent. I've just now hired my adversary right? Mm -hmm. I'm paying them 3% to negotiate against me. Yeah. So that's kind of wild. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I think it was Ira Nadich back in the day who, who explained this to me. And this is before my time, I guess, you know, before the MLS and before the MLS syndicated to Zillow, there used to just be that book, right? The MLS book of all the lists. Yes. So if you put your home on the market for sale, it makes its way somehow into this MLS book. And when a buyer wants to see homes, they contact an agent. The agent then flips through the book and says, oh, you want a two bedroom, two bedroom section. Here's the 30 homes. And I think these five are the best for you. So mm -hmm. they'll show them the five. But how does a buyer shop for a home today? They either find it themselves on Zillow and ask the realtor to show it to them, or the agent just sends them everything that's available and the, the buyer picks the best five, right? So the buyer in this case is really the one who's selecting the homes. So what am I saying here is, if the buyer wants to see 123 Main Street, whether the commission's 0% or not, they're going to find an agent who's going to show it to them. Yeah. So if, you're, if, you're, if you are their agent and you look it up and you say, oh, it's only 1% commission, I don't feel like showing you that house, well, what's the buyer going to do? They're going to call a different agent. So they're going to see that house no matter what. This is what's changed, and yeah. people don't recognize that it's changed. So we're in a very short window, in my opinion. Mm. And I think the window probably started... I'm going to say it's probably started about 10 years ago and it probably has about 10 years left. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've kind of been viewing this as a 20 year window for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I think it's got 10 years left. What's happening right now is there's enough technology that we can be extremely efficient. We can make a lot of money in real estate. We can actually service a lot of people and take care of a lot of people. And there's still a necessity to have someone involved in that transaction there's an attack on the real estate agent right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not just from the consumers because I don't find that consumers are ever unhappy with what I provide them at the price that I give it to them at. Right. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that? Right. So who's unhappy with this model? The tech companies? The tech companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Zillow's unhappy with this model. You know why? Because it's difficult to disrupt a million people that work for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's like the reverse Uber. Yeah. yeah. Right? They all work for themselves and we can't control them. We're trying to get them to buy leads from us. And that's what they're doing, right? So Zillow is selling leads at incredibly high prices. Mm -hmm. Now what they're doing is they're switching to the Zillow Flex model across the country. I'm sure it's here. It's on the coast. It's coming to our market as well. It's already there. They're going to be charging a 45% referral fee before long. That's not public and nobody said that. That's my prediction. Yeah, it's yeah. climbing, yeah. It's going to be 45% is going to go to a tech company to connect a guy that lives in your market with a seller in your market. Yeah. yeah. And so we've got legislation now. Mm. We've got lawsuits that have been won that have showed that we do not have to pay these buyer's agents 3% commission. And we've got tech companies sitting in the background. I saw this other, there was another article that came out the other day that was, they were attacking other parts of the transaction. So Zillow just bought Follow Up Boss. Mm -hmm. yeah. They obviously own all parts of the transaction. They own Dot Loop. Dot Loop, yeah. Showing Time. Showing Time. Yeah. yeah. So perfect example. So why are they buying those platforms? Well, they own data. Yeah. Data. Yeah. 
So a real estate agent's job is to know who people are and stay yeah. in front of them, right? And all they've done is completely rewire that yeah. where they can predict everybody that's going to buy and sell. Yeah. Mm. So how do you fight back? It's yeah. We did a referral recently. And just to get paid on the referral, to put the information into EXP's platform, SkySlope, mm -hmm. our, our transaction coordinator was like, what's the buyer's phone number? I was like, I don't know. I introduced the seller to uh, I introduced the seller to an agent who's local in their market. And she's like, well, who was the attorney? I was like, I don't know. I, like, I'm the referral agent. I didn't know any of the specifics of that transaction, nor should I, because I was just the referral agent. Mm -hmm. But like the light bulb went on, I'm like, e EXP and nothing against EXP, of course, we're both EXP agents. You know, they just want all that data in the, into their CRM. Who are the attorneys? Who are the seller? Who, who was the buyer? And, you know, that's the world we live in. Yeah. Well, then turning the question to you, how does an agent thrive in an industry where everybody's attacking them? That's the question that everybody needs to think about right now if they're an agent. So you yeah. got to look at value. You have to look at value and why someone would actually choose to do business with you if they have a choice. Mm -hmm. The other thing you have to look at is the technology that's keeping those platforms in front of people is available to you at a smaller scale. And are you leveraging what's available? So we decided as a company it's been three years ago now, and it's moving quickly right around COVID that think about it like Jeff Bezos thought about Amazon. Mm -hmm. So when Jeff Bezos started Amazon, he was selling books out of his garage and it worked. But his initiative wasn't like, how can we continue to sell books at a really low price? His initiative that made perfect sense to me, uh, not like I was overseeing his business plan, but what makes sense to me now in this context is... He said, I want to know everything about this customer. Mm. I want to know everything about this customer so that their preferences are dialed in. And if you go to Amazon and buy something today, is there any better purchasing experience? No. Nope. No. Is there anything, I mean, will you see something somewhere and decide, I want to buy that? And even if you could buy it where you see it, you go to Amazon to buy right. it. And now you pay more a lot of times. Happily, yeah. you pay more. Because you know yeah. it's going to be at your doorstep tomorrow, most likely. Sometimes same day, you know when it left the warehouse, you know when it's 10 blocks from your house, you know when it's on your doorstep and you yeah. know you can return it if you don't like it. Multiple dopamine hits. Yeah. That's it. And you know, not only that, but then they learn your buying pattern, right? So then the next time you log into Amazon, they're like, hey, you bought this, mm -hmm. you might also like That's this. That's it, that's it. Um, or it will remind you to subscribe, you know? So there's technology behind that. Yeah. And so how do you duplicate that? If you're a real estate agent, what I've determined is I want to know everything about a client that if they called me and said, we'd like to make a transaction, buy or sell, that I know everything about that person that they would expect me to know first. Mm -hmm. And then what else can we gather about not only their preferences around this transaction, but their preferences everywhere. Yeah. So we have databases for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Are we collecting it on a one-to-one -one basis? And when someone does business with us, are we actually delivering a service where they believe that it's easy and they come back and say everything about working with you made my life easier yeah and if you're not looking at your business like that and you're in trouble anyways right you're in trouble as far as the business is concerned because they're doing a much better job of getting in front of that person than you are mm -hmm. yeah that's so that's a big challenge for everybody but yeah. what we intend to do is on our marketing platforms stay away from all the companies that intend to asphyxiate us yeah. as much as possible, mm -hmm. which what I think about that's not going to change the industry because people, why do they have to buy leads from Zillow? Because they're hooked on it. They can't get off of it. And they can't produce it themselves. Yeah. But what is right. Zillow really selling? A connection, data. A warm lead. Yeah. An opportunity. Yeah. Well, yeah, they've paired data with a timeline mm. that actually makes sense for a salesperson. And so what we do bad is nurturing. identifying and nurturing on that timeline. Yeah, salespeople were naturally impatient. You want somebody who's going to do something today, and we get frustrated when you, you know, you touch base with somebody who's not ready to do something for a year. So Zillow is just warming these people up because That's, most people are not good at the nurturing. Yeah. And then retargeting them, which is a very yeah. cheap and easy, effective way to market to your database, but most people don't understand how it's achieved. Yeah. And that means when they do re-enter, I mean, we have a basic website mm -hmm. that we drive leads from. Yeah. And if someone comes back to the website, this technology is very available. We get a notification that says, John is back on the website after yeah. 30 days, right? Yeah. That's, and then guess what they do? 
they have an ISA that calls and mm. says, you're back on the website. Would you like to meet with an agent? And when it's warm, they push it yeah. to the agent, right? Yeah. So it's a very, very basic funnel that you can duplicate. But how do you get ahead of that? How do you get ahead of the technology piece? You adapt quickly. Well, you can't really, it's going to cannibalize itself anyway, but you have to find a way to make sure that that client is going to use you and not go onto those websites to get into that funnel to begin with. Mm -hmm. So how do you build a connection or a rapport with them so that they use you before anything else? Let's look at Amazon again. You've mm -hmm. got the people that were in business selling books before Amazon. Mm -hmm. eBay, yeah. Barnes & Noble. What was the other one? It's out of, it's out of business because of Amazon. Oh, Borders. Borders Books. Yeah. 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 yeah, so Borders is out of business because... Amazon completely took the book business away. Mm. But Barnes & Noble has managed to create a nuance now where they actually still have bookstores. Mm. We, we have one in my market. People still enjoy to go to the bookstore. They want to go there and be around books, yeah. right? Aside from just a library. And they've managed to survive. How? The experience is different. Yeah, it's probably about the experience. It's got to be, right? Yeah. I like to go there. It's a perfect example. Because if I was going to buy a book, I'd jump on and buy it on Amazon. Yeah. But do I like Barnes & Noble? Absolutely. And I see that there's a necessity for it in the marketplace. So let's connect it. I don't think that necessarily that there's only just going to be a few real estate agents that are nuanced. And it's like, oh, I used to have a real estate agent too. You got one. But we're headed that direction. You've got travel agents that are like that. Mm -hmm. Like, Do you have a travel agent? No. no. Everybody that was traveling as much as you travel 25 years ago had an agent yeah. that would help, right? So that's gone. Yeah. And what they did though, was they fought the idea that they had to change their business model completely. Yeah. And Expedia, ex I mean, the people that run Zillow, they created that, they created Expedia, they created all that. Yeah. So it's the same thing. That's a good segue into the new agent model then. So what is, how does an agent in today's world adapt with the model? So this could be fair, a little bit controversial, mm -hmm. but what I believe an agent has to do, so let's back up. Where companies are going is a volume model, mm -hmm. which means the company takes very little money and the agent has, in some cases, low skill, in some cases, high skill, but really no oversight in terms of what the service they offer, mm -hmm. right? And that's the company's model. And they're forced to deliver that model because people are not going to pay a lot of money for an association with a real estate brokerage that provides nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. So a long time ago, when real estate was, you know, new in terms of brokerages, let's say the '60s and '70s. Let's just go there in terms of history. Once they started having legislation around brokerage and cooperation and things like that, there was a book, and there was people that would come in to the real estate office, and the company would drive the leads. They would train the salespeople. They would drive the leads. They would handle the transaction, right? They would Have provide- Have storefront. Store, yep. They, yeah. Marketing at some level, whether it was newspaper or just a storefront that would attract customers. And then they would have things like coaching and training, right? Well, and then fast forward, you've got Remax that comes through in the 70s and says, you don't need any of that. You don't need training. You don't need coaching. You don't need administrative help. All you need is a lower or a higher split. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you need a higher split because you're driving all the deals anyways. Yeah. So let's go ahead and have you do that. And we'll give you an 80% split, 80-20, right? And then you go further and you've got Keller Williams and down the line EXPs and LTPs Real, and Real yeah. and all these. Is it LTP? That's the new one, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Sounds like I think LTP. <laughs> What's the name? Austin Zabak, who we just had on a couple yeah. months ago. He just went there. Oh, really? He was the biggest agent, I think, in Arizona. Wow. He was at EXP, he left no. just like a week ago. He left EXP for LTP. Right. That was the first I'd heard of them. Yeah. Maybe he's on PCP. But of course know. now <laughs> but of course now they're the fastest growing online. Oh yes. Real, yeah. You, you know. went from one to eight, you know, yeah. now you're eight thousand yeah. percent. Yeah. So. Well, I don't know anything about their production. I, I've heard about the company and I've actually heard really good things about it, but I hear good things about yeah. companies that have a good model all the time. Yeah. And I don't have anything against that. So the models change. Yeah. The splits are getting higher. So now the brokerage cannot offer services that they used to offer. They can't train. Mm -hmm. So now you get a new agent to the company. Let's say you recruit a new agent. Let's say somebody at LTP creates a company and a team and recruits an agent. 
Well, there's no training, there's no coaching, there's no history, there's no role play, there's no scripts, dialogues, mindset. They're, they don't have that, yeah. do they? No. And so what they've done is they've degraded an industry to the point where it's able to be disrupted. Mm, true. So if that's the case, how do we fight back? Well, here's what I've done. I started a company a year ago that's just a small company. It's named after me in my market because that's where I decided to be. And at the time I thought, add a lot of agents and throw enough stuff at the wall and the ones that can do something will do something and the ones that won't, they won't, right? Mm -hmm. And that's okay, I'll drive leads to them and we've got a good system and we've got good people in place behind the scenes. They can't screw it up that bad, right? Yeah. That's kind of the model and it's worked for some people. So legislation happens, lawsuits come down. I start to see in the marketplace a little bit further and I'm humbly, I'm telling you, I'm learning after a year in the business, a year with my own company, 20 years in the business, it's not gonna work. Mm. So every agent at the company has to be able to make a presentation to a seller and a buyer. Every agent at the company has to represent the company at the highest level. Yeah. Every agent at the company has to understand the history of agents and why they're effective and what the values they produce that will actually sell in the marketplace. They have to understand how to differentiate and to build relationships with clients and deliver a service that's good. Mm -hmm. If they can't do that, then why have a company? Yeah. No, that's a valid one. The one thing that comes to mind is when John D. Rockefeller was taken to court to break down yeah. the monopoly, the one thing he said is I came to an industry with chaos and I brought order to it. So you're basically saying that our industry has been saturated with people, especially with like, you know, the the companies that are based off of like downlines and stuff, you're incentivized to recruit, but not incentivized to train and like to polish the person that's being given to the client or the customer. You don't have any money. You don't have enough, as a broker. Yeah, you, you, don't, you don't have enough money to actually that's support right. them. So then it's like- But at the same time, the brokers that did have the money weren't necessarily providing enough value oftentimes. Well, that's because Even the if margins they did have the kept money getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, essentially teams are what brokerages used to be now, if you think right. about that's it. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. That's the way they should be treated. Yeah. But it's, it's degraded to the point where it's embarrassing. Yeah. It's true. So when people, I've talked to people in my database and they say, what do you think about this lawsuit business? Like, this is pretty bad for your industry, right? Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. This is the best cleansing that could ever happen. My industry is so ridiculous yeah. that anybody can be a real estate agent with no intentions of ever learning anything about the business or doing one good thing with that piece of knowledge. Yeah. You don't think I'm happy as a professional that actually there's something it's, in place? Yeah, it's, it's a cleanse. It's going to wash a lot of people out. It's a much needed cleanse to say. That, that's, that's what I think. Yeah. yeah. So let's take a step back. So let's assume that you had to coach John today when he was doing 25 deals a year, right? And John comes up to you and he says, hey, listen, I wanna double my business. Mm. How would you tee him up for success? That's a good question. So we're, go we're gonna say that I'm dealing with someone that's 25 deals a year mm -hmm. and they're trying to get to 50 and beyond. Yep. I've spent a lot of my career trying to figure out how to help agents do just that. Mm -hmm. A lot of my time now is spent getting agents from 10, 15 deals to 50 deals, but 25 to say 95 is kind of the sweet spot for me if you were, if I was gonna coach someone. Mm -hmm. If someone's doing 25 deals, what you're gonna recognize is a couple of different things. One, you find someone who's fairly rare that is taking on prospecting the way John did, like expireds for sale by owners or the sources where a, a particular personality type can do well in those most of the time though, you find someone doing 25 deals and 23 of them are from their database. Mm. And 22 of them, they stumbled on kind of because of their database. Yeah. So there's a couple of different agents there. The challenge as an individual agent today doing 25 deals is you don't have access to the technology. You don't have access to the infrastructure. You don't have access to good coaching. It's expensive. Everything's expensive, mm. right? So when agents join my company, they get access to leads and coaching and training. So I think the number one thing that I would offer for anybody that's at that production level is, this is not gonna be that surprising probably to anybody, but they yeah. have to get around somebody that can provide those things to them that understands the nature of the entire business. Mm. Yeah, and I think like for me, like you said, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I was doing 25 coming right from my database 
just straight from people who were calling me that I had rented places to before or people that just knew I was in the business, thankfully, uh, would reach out to me. But I think where you were great and what people need is to shift that mindset and, and, and realize it's okay to hunt for business, right? A lot of people feel like they're, you know, it's, it's strange to ask for business and, and be like, you have to have that hunter mindset to double your business, right? Because even the best agents in the world, I mean, rarely are getting 50 deals maybe from their COI without at least nurturing those people. Yeah. So you have to have that mentality. And, but right, it's not sexy to prospect, right? Like now it's like, oh, I'm, I get all my business from, you know, Instagram and just because I, I make videos and I stay top of mind. But like, yeah, do that, you that's what people want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's yeah. what new agents get, who get yeah. into the business. That's what they want to hear. Oh, if I just make it, you know, it's the funniest. It's what everybody does. Brand new agent. They get their license. Day two, they start their David Vanoy real estate Instagram. And now they've got two <laughs> yeah. Instagrams. It's like, yeah, and, and they think that yeah. like the deals are just going to flow into their DMs. But, you know, long story short, I think people have to be willing to hunt for it. That's where social media fits in for people that they need to understand. It's not an opportunity to market to people. It's an opportunity for you to one, step into who you truly are. Yep. And two, share that with the people that could connect with it. Yeah. So if they see me, they're not buying my knowledge because right. the truth is they don't think that real estate agents have a lot of knowledge. Right but they buy why I do it. So if you hire me, I'm gonna take care of these kids and this family and this house and this dog, and I'm gonna do the right things with it. And that's yeah. what they buy into, right? Right. Right. Which is the right things. Yeah. And I'm gonna yeah. build out a company that's gonna provide a service that's lasting. That's a great initiative and someone could buy into that. Yeah. yeah. That was Seth Godin. Seth Godin, Godin. is a excellent marketing guy. And yeah. that, I think that book was called Tribes. Mm. definitely worth reading. He's from around here. Yeah. yeah. He might be New York. I'm going to go visit him after I leave here, actually. <laughs> Let People him know. People don't buy goods and services. They buy relationship stories and magic. Yeah. Well, that's why I always laugh when agents continually just post, just sold, just listed, just yeah. uh, year-end wrap-ups. This year we did $50 million. Like The only people that they're flexing in front of is, is other agents, right? And don't, don't get me wrong, I'm guilty of that. Yeah. You scroll down on my Instagram far enough, you'll see just sold and just listed. And it's, it's good to sprinkle that stuff in just so people know that you're active. But if that's all you're putting out there, I think uh, nobody cares. No, right? I they, just left a real estate office yeah. and I was talking with the owner of the company there. Yeah. And he said, yeah, well, how do you share like the company goals and all that stuff with the people that are on the team and stuff? And I said, are you under the impression that they care about that? Yeah. Well, and he was kind of like, well, what do you mean? I'm supposed to present like we're trying to do this many deals and together and we're supposed, no, you're supposed to present that we're working together. We're building something together. We're excited to work together. Do you really think that they care if you're going to try to make $2 million this year? Mm, right. And if they do get excited about you making $2 million, is that the person that you want? That what they're thinking is, what about me? Yeah. Mm. And that's what they should be thinking. The problem we have as team leaders or as business owners is we don't go into it with the idea that it should be all about you. Yeah. What are you trying to accomplish? Because I'm trying to build something bigger than myself. Yeah. You're a part of something bigger than yourself. Let's talk about how you fit into that. Yeah. Yeah. The company's gonna achieve all their goals. I have those goals. That's not a sales meeting. Yeah. yeah. So on yeah. that same vein, let's talk about leverage then, because you're really, really good at leveraging technology and always adapting with the new technology that comes up to benefit your business. So what are some of the changes that you are, are, are teaching or like helping people utilize in their business today to gain that leverage? Well, I think what Follow Up Boss has done with the CRM has been incredible. Mm -hmm. And we've tried many CRMs up until then. We use another product called Brivity right now. Mm -hmm. I like Brevity because it's got great transaction management. It's got good, happy checklists, and my team really likes that product. And so we do things inside of there like market reports, listing alerts, and things like that for our clients that I think is great. Inside of Follow Up Boss, though, what it's done is unified communication. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think other people are going to try to duplicate, and I hope that they do. I know some companies are trying to figure this piece of it out. But I can hire an agent today, put them inside of the CRM, assign them a phone number inside the CRM. Mm -hmm. All of our agents make every single phone call from Follow Up Boss, 100% of their phone calls. Yep. All their emails come from our email addresses. So 
much like Jeff Bezos wants to own the data, I also want to own the channel, mm -hmm. right? That's what I can do as a, as a small business owner is own the channel that they're using and own the credentials that they're using and, and manage all of that communication and oversee it. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that leveraging technology is a must. And yeah. it's so inexpensive now for you to manage that part of the transaction there that it's, but how many people actually have something like that in place? Not many. Yeah. Especially it, the solo agent does not have that. Yeah. Well, I think it was, I forgot where we were talking about this before. I think I was three years into the business full time until I realized like, man, I'm running my own business, right? Like, cause the first two, three years, at least for me, was always just like chasing a deal, chasing a deal, chasing with no SOPs, no structure, no process, no, all right. So once you get a listing, this is what you do next. And then you do a price reduction on week, you know, two, if it doesn't sell and, and like no, no, no real strategy. It was just chase as many deals as I could find yeah. and, and hope that they work with me. And then year two, I was like, hmm, hmm, we're having the same conversations with people over and over again. Man. We need to have more of a structure. And then, you know, hmm, maybe we should keep track of all of these people, you know, after we sell their home. And it was like, of course, you know, I'm, I'm being sarcastic, but you know that you should be doing some of this. But like, you know, unless you're putting in the time on a Saturday or Sunday to come in and be like, OK, here's some time where I have some breathing room. I can instill some some structure. Yeah, I don't know. It's It's tough. Yeah. You have to set aside the time to do that. What was really cool, I remember about you specifically, was you came from the financial industry. You were an accountant, or you had an accountant major, right? Finance, yeah. Okay, you, yeah. from fine. Did you have an accounting major? No, mainly like real estate finance. Okay, real estate finance. Okay, well, yeah. I remember that financial background because yeah. you had far more understanding of like business and the financial end of a business. But then when you got into real estate, I think you were convinced that you were supposed mm -hmm. to become a cowboy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's it was true. like gunslinging. and like, well, I know that I came from yeah. organization and numbers yeah. and like, yeah. but I, isn't this what I'm supposed to be doing here? Yeah. Like this? Yeah. And it was like, all right, well, we can have structure here too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and it's... You Those know. Google Sheets for like the the tracking the transactions, the checks, all that stuff yeah. that came from you, if I remember correctly, yeah, right? I think so. Yeah. So that's that's that organization for like actually documenting everything. We had a little network of people that were doing the same amount of deals, and it was just a basic way of organizing thought. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in the same vein of tech, how about AI in real estate? How does that work today? AI is a big one. I mean, people are talking a lot about AI. I got a call today from someone on AI that was trying to sell, and it was very noticeably like, hey, this is Rebecca from so-and-so, yeah. the Realtors Association. I was like, I got you, this is, <laughs> and I'll hang up on a robot real fast. Mm, yeah. But I've heard some calls that are, some outbound AI phone calls that are actually fairly decent. And I know mm. that technology's there and it's coming pretty quickly. So here's what I would say about AI. So let's look at like ChatGPT as an example. Mm. The biggest thing that we haven't seen yet that I think is going to be really influential in the space of chat GPT and real estate is the ability to upload. Mm. Right? So I can go to chat GPT and say, tell me how to organize my business. Well, we've had Google for a long time. We can always do that. It's just kind of cool the way it tells you mm. and like reads you the web page. Yeah. Right. But we've had that. Yeah. But what chat GPT can do is I can take an original document. I can upload it to ChatGPT and I can ask ChatGPT based on my preferences and style about that contract, who's mm -hmm. in favor, buyer or seller, if there's any loose ends or if there's any areas of the contract that we should review. Yeah. Wow. Cool, you, you right? Know, you, you can, can upload that. a recording. You, you can, can upload, upload a, recording. a sales call yeah. of like me making a call to a prospect and you can say, coach me on how to call, make this call better in the vein of Mike Ferry. That's hot. Yeah. Or tell That's me insane. where I lost this prospect or, or tell me where like, you know, it, it seems like the call went south yeah. or, or something like that. I haven't done it, but who was our guest that was uh, very uh, well versed in, in <laughs> chat, uh, in, in AI? He was awesome. And uh, he shared a lot of those tips and tricks. Like Did stuff he? like that, where you could upload. It was it was like going through like certain question prompts, but the adding in the contract, that's pretty insane. Because that? if you have 30, 40% fallout rates in transactions in that market like this, that in itself helps because you're doing everything you can for your client to represent their best interests. And if something happens, it's not like you did your part. 
in your due diligence. But we've had the other piece where you could go basically get the information. Mm. It's just going to come to us quicker. So, you know, we could go down a rabbit hole and you could be wearing glasses that will help you to inspect the home and tell you based on the age of the property, right? Yeah. Or, or you've got a, a chip in your brain that tells you the words that you need. So yeah. that we could go crazy with that. Yeah. But at some level, assuming that there's still people once we get through all this, mm. do you prefer to work with a person if you can? Of course. Yeah. So, yeah. So how do you become that? Here's what I've always said. I've always said they're going to disrupt the industry at some level. Yeah. Somebody's going to take over because it's ripe for that, because it's been degraded to the point where it's embarrassing. Yeah. And whatever company they have that runs all those people, I'll just be at the top of that one. Yeah. That's fine. They'll still need somebody to do that. Mm. Yeah. What? Well, and this has been said before. It's not that AI is going to replace the realtor. It's going to be a agents that use AI that replace the agents who don't. That's a great way to say it. We had yeah. a guy named Tristan who used to um, he, he also EXP and lab he's, coat. Yeah, lab from Lab Coat Agents. Oh, yeah. And, I'm familiar with this product. Yeah. And uh, he was um, he was telling us that his belief is that AI agents will replace teams. And then yeah. they'll be like the AI agent is the person that's able to leverage AI to help with lead generation, help with like warming up, nurturing the lead. The same thing that like a Zillow does today, right? And then it'll just tee them up so that way their income producing hours increases significantly. And that replaces the need for like admin support, X, Y, and yeah. Z, all those other backend stuff. If we go backwards on this and yeah. we just kind of trace this down, this yeah. is pretty clear. If you go back and you look at farming, yeah. And there used to be a guy out there with a hoe, like doing this, yeah. right? And that's obviously replaced by a machine that can do that. So now we have a company and at the top, there's people that make a lot of money. At the bottom, there's people that don't make as much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the people at the very bottom are the most able to be disrupted, mm -hmm. right? And if I've got someone at the desk who's typing a description for a house, yeah. that's easy, that's yeah. gone. If you do that and that's your job, you're in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you're communicating at a level that people can actually take action or make a decision to buy or sell from you, that's not that can't be that's valuable. It's going to be more valuable. People think it's going to be less valuable because chat GPT. No, it's going to be more valuable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Like a phone call. The, these these team leaders that are using AI and instilling all of these tactics that we've been talking about today are simply just doing what the brokers should have been doing. And if the brokers were doing that, and providing that value to the people on their team, then you know the brokerage model may still exist. But now, like we've said, the team leaders are just doing what the brokers should have done. So team leaders are following this, and they've watched brokers dig their own graves, but they're still following them down that rabbit hole. Mm. If you notice, but team they're, they're doing what they should have done, right? Like so, they may have like said, "Hey, you can go to KV Core Coaching on Friday," but it's like. You know, maybe not the best coaching. No. Okay, so let me go a different direction yeah. than that. Team leaders are digging their own graves on this because the they could hire an agent, train them, give them leads, help them with their marketing, support their business administratively, and do all and provide all those services and take a split that makes sense. Right. Instead of doing that, what they do is they expand their recruiting effort. They add more people, give them nothing, give them an incredibly high split, and just hope that because of their culture, that Stay. they retain them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when they sell next to nothing, what they say is they might sell something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So they're going down the same path as the broker. And right. now you just have one more middleman. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Who are you in the transaction? Why are you even here? Yeah. Are you training someone? Are you adding value? Are you making the industry better? Are you putting someone in a position where they can actually make a livable wage? Yeah. yeah. If so you're what, not doing that, so you're what's out. what's the difference between uh, a team leader who's doing that and somebody who's... It's it's a commitment to a minimum standard. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, if you, and, but I think the old brokerage model, though, you could stay on the team or in the brokerage even if you didn't you know, you know how hard I've tried to even, get fired from brokerages? You know how hard I've tried? <laughs> I heard stories. Yeah. <laughs> Some of my best stories ever are from David and his uh, his prior colleagues, but you know those will be told later. But, 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 staying, but, but, but you can stay, if you don't produce anything, you, you stay at the brokerage because- Why though? Why? Because they can't fire you. 
Well, because you're an independent contractor, and whether you're you do a deal contractor. or you don't do a deal, it's like, well, if they do it, great. If they don't, we don't lose anything. There's no I think incentive. independent contractor well, is just an excuse. Well, I think the other thing, too, is and Mike Ferry always says it, right? The average agent does two deals a year. So if you somehow manage to do two deals a year, one of which is probably your own house, selling your own <laughs> house or selling yourself your house, then you stay on the team because you're the average agent or you've, you've, you've done what the average agent in your market does. But once those minimum standards are instilled, you, you can't instill the minimum standards at a regular brokerage, but you can do it when you run a team. Well, let's let's shift plays real, real quick. So let's talk about the team models that actually do work, because there's a million and one ways that they won't actually work. So, so how does what do you mean? team model? So how does somebody structure a team model today and the different kinds of team models? So like you said, someone starting off their best bet is getting into an organization like an organization similar to what you have. Where yeah. They have OK, let's go further. Yeah. So what's the next step from there if they want to be independent and grow their own? From a company level or from an individual agent? Individual agent. Okay. If I'm an individual agent and I'm doing 25 years e deals a year and I mm -hmm. want to maintain and stay in the business. And you want to maintain, stay in the business? And, or no. So let's look at, like, all right. They just started. Your recommendation, your advice is go find a team that will provide structure, leads, training. Then let's they, go a step above it. Okay. Let's, let's, let's get up a little bit and let's talk about what the real opportunity is. All right. All right. And how we actually got here. Okay. Okay, so I gave a presentation to a group of salespeople, and the way I said it to them was, the amount of money that you make this year as, a de as an agent doing 25 deals mm -hmm. is really just the amount of money that you have now to reinvest in your future self. Mm -hmm. it's, that's all that is. It's not even a livable wage based on where you can go. It's just the amount of money that you get to invest in coaching, training, books, flying to different cities and meeting with people and learning about the industry. That's what real estate provides people. And that's the people that should be attracted to it. So if you're going to be in the real estate business and you intend to grow the real estate business, you should be spending thousands of dollars on, I was at one point between coaching and everything related to being coached as an agent, spending $50,000 a year. Yeah. And there's people that go 25 years in the business and have never spent $5,000 on consulting, coaching, or anything that could improve them. Mm. It's yeah. an investment in yourself. That's the first pillar. That's the first step. Yeah, but it's kind of cliche to say invest in yourself because every, they go, eh, invest in yourself, read a book. It's a commitment mm. over time to do all of those things forever on who you get to be when it's over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who are you trying to be? You want to be someone that read a couple of books and found a hack and yeah. found a, a <clears throat> corner or an edge or a little area. If you look at the transaction and you say, I don't really know how I got here. I don't know how to sustain this. Mm -hmm. There is a huge opportunity for you to become a way better person over 10 years. Yeah. yeah. You don't know what you don't know. And you're, it's, it's a way to um, speed up the process, yeah. right? I predict, this is what I'm going to predict mm -hmm. right now that 10 years from now, mark the day. Do, like, can we bury a time capsule behind this? <laughs> we might find a body. There's we a might find of, Hoffa. There's a lot of shit buried around <laughs> okay. here. Yeah. Forget the burying. There is a prison Forget like that. very near. We're yeah. not burying shit. Yeah. Okay. But if we take a time capsule, yeah. right? What I'm going to say now is 10 years from now, this is going to be bold. None of us will actually be doing what we do currently. Agreed. Yeah. We will still be close to the industry. We will be even in the industry. The way that we're compensated and the way that we're managing our businesses will be nothing like what 100%. it is right now. Mm. Yeah. What do you think it's going to be like? It might even be in five years. Five years? Maybe. Okay. That's even more bold. Well, That's think zesty. Of, think how <laughs> I would say it's pretty different today than it was John's five like, years it's ago. It's done in my head. Yeah, so. oh, maybe three years. Like. <laughs> Steal my riz over three. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, so how do you think it will change? And how does somebody stay ahead of that adapting so they don't end up being a victim of it? Well, so here's how it connects, right? right? So I said, let's just figure out who you can become over 10 years. Make yourself a really good person. Make yourself a valuable. I said, if they have a company and they're in charge of people and they're selling products, I'll be in charge of that company, Yeah. right? So that's an example, but here's how it connects. So right now, who cares if they have real estate agents? I don't care. Somebody's going to be selling something to somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, every single skill set that I've developed exactly. is available. I don't have to sell. So we get to think like real estate agents far too frequently and less mm -hmm. like business people. This is what yeah. we talked about today. Yeah. Well, I remember we were on a call with Bernie once. I remember specifically we were in that office at 50 Harrison. We were yeah. sitting we're in that room with the there. long tables. Yep. And we were on a, a call with Bernie and just enamored to be able to be in his presence. Yeah. At that time, there was a lot less conversations with him. And... He's like, you know what your problem is, guys? Stop thinking like a fucking realtor. Yeah. 
And he's right. And he's like, Bernie beats that drum well. And he's right. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, just, you have to think like a business owner. And I think you hit the nail on the head. All of the, you know, the the beauty of this business is you're learning how to run a business, whether you're selling real estate, buying real estate or whatever. Like we always joke, like the goal when, when uh, we were running our team together was to train our salespeople so well that like, if just tomorrow we decide that selling solar panels is a better opportunity, yeah, that's fine. Then we all shifted selling solar panels. Yeah. Right. Like if if there's a better opportunity and things that, like you said are going to change ten years, five years maybe, then you know we all need to be able to adapt. And the ones who adapt are the ones that move forward. Here's what people need to do. Like today, find a dark space, find a place in your office with a whiteboard. Mm. Take the whiteboard. Write at the top of it revenue. Mm. And I want you to literally spend an hour alone in silence. And I want you to write out all the different ways that you know how to make money in this business. Mm. And then what I'd like you to do from there is to circle and highlight a few that you're attracted to, figure out which ones are easy to implement and maybe you've missed and start developing yourself in those two to three areas immediately. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What I love about and, you. And I think too, just take that a step further. Remember what you love about him. I will. Don't forget. I, I'm um, sorry. Don't forget. I do. <laughs> is. <laughs> I could have said it already. But go not on. only areas that you're good at that you can generate money, but you have to turn that into ways to create passive income. Yeah. Right. Because I think far too many of us fall into the trap, myself included, um, of generating that money, upgrading your lifestyle, but not finding ways to create passive income. We talked about this today and yeah. I'm going to, I want to piggyback on that a little bit yeah. though. Cause I think there's something more to it for you, especially yeah. cause I watched you at a time in your career where thinking bigger was the next thing. Yeah. Meaning you needed that next. Yeah. And I think now as I watch you review your career, you question whether or not you should have replaced thinking big and upgrading yeah. with investing. Yeah. And here's what I'm going to tell you on that. I think that you had it in the right order. Yeah. I think you had to go through that process of realizing who you could be yeah. and what you could possibly do and what you could build and think that big and reap the benefit and drive a nicer car and buy a bigger house and spend the money in order to become the person now yeah. that can make the kind of money that you can make with that size shovel yeah. and now save it. Yeah. So I don't think it was in the wrong order for you. Okay. He said he had a nice shovel. You got a big, big old shovel, show. boy. Ooh. <laughs> Barely fit into this table. <laughs> He's turning red, too. Um, no, but the, the one thing I love about you is that it's like, uh, I feel like you have pillars in the way that you, like, at least coached me. It was, he, well, hold on. He was building me up. Was yeah. there anything else you wanted to say you. there? Yeah, right. I was going to throttle God. him a little yeah, bit yeah, more. Yeah, another thing to say? You guys want me to lock, you're lock in, the What room. I meant was, you're in the right <laughs> sequence. Yeah, yeah. Perfectly in the right sequence. Did that resonate with you? No, 100%. 100%. It's just... Uh, we all fall into that trap of comparing sometimes. Yeah. And you say, well, shit, you know, I've got a lot of, I do have assets, but are those assets making me income or are they just sitting there? Right. So, you know, you come into like, like we had, um, Can we San need Diego. a list on the wall of everyone that's ever been on the podcast <laughs> yeah, yeah, from yeah. now on? Voltaire. We can't Voltaire. be doing this. Yeah. There Voltaire, you go. Voltaire, San Diego. Oh, yep. Age of Enlightenment. 50, 55 yeah. something, <laughs> 55 something right. units. And I'm like, well, shit, man. You know, and and I, I don't know. I just constantly come back yeah. to the fact that I need to buy more. Yeah, but that's income. a great character trait that you have. That's yeah. what drives you. That's true. Yeah, yeah. that and that. you need that. Yeah. By the way, you're going to call me at some point in your life and you're going to not have that yeah. because you've had too much success. Yeah. And you're going to say like, I don't know what to do next. Like I've just crushed all this shit and now I got nothing left. So be thankful for the moment that you've got that like, why do I not? I've been searching for this. I've been yeah. talking to people about this recently. And I asked this guy, he's incredibly wealthy, lives in my town. And I said, how do you stay like excited about what you're doing? And I, he says, like, I wake up in the morning, like, God, these people are getting, they got more than me. Why can't I? Yeah. That's hard to buy. Yeah. Mm. It's almost in psychotic phases though, because sometimes we'll end this, they'll be like. It's the best. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. You need to be a little bit crazy. I'm I'm too empathetic. Like when he broke a million in 2020, I was more excited than he was. 
Why is that oh, empathy? Like, Why is that empathy? Because you you feel the person's excitement. Like you're 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 in their shoes. You can see it from their perspective. Yeah, but you were basically saying that you're excited and he's not. Well, he I bought him champagne. I was like, we're gonna do this whole thing. Everybody was and just I'm like, like dude, we gotta get back to work. Yeah, and everybody else was like, do we really have to do this? I'm like, that's a big deal. And I was like so excited. And then he was just like, all right, we're done. I'm like, all right, fuck you then. Like, <laughs> you ever seen the like, you ever going. seen the uh, video of Kobe Bryant when he was in the middle of the finals? No, yeah. he's like not done. Yeah, game not done. They interviewed him. He's game like, now that you've uh... he says, well, you're up two zero. You're up two zero in the in the finals here. Don't you want don't you want to say something about that? Aren't you yeah. excited? He goes, job's not done. Yeah, job yeah. done. Yeah. Job's not done. Yeah, that's what Skip was hitting you with, bro. Yeah. Job's not yeah. done. Well, we've all felt that though. What? You're like, oh, I, well, you know, when I may close this deal, I'm going to upgrade my apartment. And then you buy the apartment and nothing happens. Or you upgrade the apartment or you, you so get you're saying yourself, it's all for nothing. Like, like <laughs> when you purchase the Rolex, I don't know if you're wearing it, right? Yeah. You were so excited. You said, oh, when I hit this number of deals, I'm going to buy myself the watch. And then you bought it. And the next day, you're like, okay, what's next? Yeah. You know, it's, well, it opens up your appetite. You set these like sort of strange goals for yourself. Not strange, but, you know. So here's the truth. For yourself and you hit it. And then you just say, oh, well, what's next? Here's the truth about all that. Yeah. It's all for nothing. Yeah. It's all literally just in place for us to drive ourselves like little ants to the next thing we can build. But guess what? That's the most exciting part about it. So yeah. don't rob yourself of that. So when you wake up or you have a conversation and you think, that guy's got 55 units, that son of a bitch is kicking my ass. That's the best part of your life, buddy. It's true. Don't change that. Yeah, I like that. That leads back to my what comment. What you love about Van Noy. Yeah, yeah. So Can we get to that part? Sorry. Yeah. sorry. It, it, it's, you have like pillars that you coach on. So the first part is the B, which is literally what we just witnessed right now. And the second part, I feel like, is skills. And the third part is leveraging your time. Have you decided that this is my coaching model? Or is this? It's what I feel like it <laughs> okay. was. Okay. So you're saying, okay, tell me what, what it is then. I, the B. The B. The, the, the way that you are as yes, a person, right? Yes. And then the skills. Yeah. So it's like becoming very, very skillful. Um, coming from a place of power, coming from a place of actually helping, not just trying to yeah. just force somebody to do something. That was a big thing that you helped me with, uh, power versus force. Yep. And then the third mm. part is leverage, where it's like, well, what about this way? Did you think about it this way? Why that way specifically? Is it set in stone that way? And it's like thinking outside the box as well. What do you mean leverage? Yeah. Be like, more. Like, so like for instance, when, when the time that you were coaching me was mm. in 2020, right? And that that was during COVID. Uh, time so like the, the market was going crazy but we were building the isa outbound team yeah right so you were helping with a lot of like the the way of thinking about it in this aspect that aspect and the conversion ratio wasn't the most ideal on the time and then you were like saying okay this is how you come from a place of power versus force and this is how you get the conversions and literally i think it was like seven months in there were 60 listings that i had taken right from going through it but then there were so many times where i would take a listing and then the person would be like all right we're gonna cancel we're not gonna go sell anymore and you're like, see, you you did so good of a job to convince them, right? But now let's focus yeah. on like actually like going in a different strategy from there. So like, all right. So here, let me connect that. Here's what I think. Here's what I think I was doing then, and and the way you'd apply it now. Mm. So what you were big on at the time was mousetrap, 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 mm -hmm. right? It, this I just want to make a what better mousetrap. Mouse trap? Oh, I okay. make yeah. a better one. Yeah, yeah. Right. And if I make this perfect mousetrap, then no mouse will ever get out, mm -hmm. right? And it was, and it's uh, it's brilliant in the way that you approach it. But what I offered earlier, I think, is what you miss, if that's the case, what you're missing is who you get to become over 10 years by going through the process. So shortcut yeah. mm -hmm. the mousetrap, fine. Mm -hmm. Don't shortcut doing the work on yourself every day and becoming the person that they would choose anyways. Mm -hmm. Have 52 rob robots that will set the appointments, fine. Show up as the person that they go, that is my dude. And that guy gets me and cares about me and will do a good job for me. That's that's the guy that, mm. that I was working on. And we would confuse the mousetrap mm. with the effort on the building of you. Mm. That I, resonate different? Yeah, it hit home. Yeah, I get it. I get it. it it's, it's because the, the, the whole thing was trying to be meticulous between tactical and like the logistics of the person that was there. So it was like two two different hats. It was hard for us, I guess, to carry different hats when trying to build and drive the plane at the same time. It was it was very challenging to do that at the same time. But yeah, that makes that makes less. Well, if you had to go deeper on that, right? So yeah. in the next ten years, how does what aspects should be focused on? So what I said, everything that makes me valuable in the marketplace that I am that confident that mm -hmm. I can survive any marketplace is exactly what I'm encouraging you to do. Mm -hmm. So an example is you're trying to build a mousetrap, let's say, where 
robots can set the appointments mm -hmm. as an example. I encourage you to do that. But the problem is, is someone smarter is going to come along and they're going to make a thing where a thousand <laughs> robots can set the appointments. And now yours is obsolete. But what do you have and what are you working on that nobody can take away from you? Mm. What are you working on that nobody can take away from you? I want to say people skills, but that's not it's bullshit. Wouldn't. <laughs> I give good hugs. <laughs> it, it's a, I'm like, be, damn, I'm glad he didn't ask me that one. <laughs> I know the answer should be client experience. Okay. Client experience is one. Let's go further on what I'm building that mm. nobody can take from me. The experience of being in the business as long as I have, working with people that are trying to improve. Mm the experience of doing the work myself and knowing exactly what it feels like to overcome challenge. Yeah. The knowledge that I've gained by reading the books, going to the seminars, paying attention to smart people, watching good podcasts, that if I sit in a room and there's a challenge on the whiteboard and they say, how do we solve this? And I can say, this is how we solve this, mm -hmm. right? I've worked on that skill to the point where I could be valuable in that room. So anybody that wants to have longevity, including, including you, needs to be thinking about how can I add value in that room and gain the experience that in any situation, they can call on me and I can solve those problems. Now that takes a lot of self inventory, but do you have a knowledge base about the financial piece of the business? Do you have the knowledge base about management and structure of companies? Mm -hmm. Do you have the mm -hmm. knowledge base about the technology? And we just went through the history of real estate and why it's there. You know how many real estate agents have no idea where real estate agents came from and why they even exist? Mm. Yeah, I, I think in this business, it's, I become a psychologist and a problem solver at the same time. I think those two skills with the tech ability or that part of it, but the management. And the if you were running part. a company tomorrow mm -hmm. and now th this building is now a company and there's there's 4,000 people in this building. Yeah. And you run the company now. You're in charge of mindset. You're in charge of culture. Mm -hmm. You're in charge of values. Okay. You're in charge of direction. Mm -hmm. You're in charge of marketing. You're in charge of technology. You're in charge of all these things. Yep. That's what real estate agents are. They're in charge of all those things, right? Mm -hmm. There's 4,000 people here and they need you to direct all of them. Mm -hmm. Do you have an understanding of what each department needs to be doing? No, but I could if I applied myself to knowing exactly <laughs> what. <laughs> this, no, but this but is the opportunity. Yeah, right? got it. Do, that's why whatever existing company is there, you'll be the top of it by understanding you're invaluable at that point. And that's just one example. But, mm -hmm. what, I, but what I'm offering is you get the opportunity. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. You get the opportunity to invest in all of these skill sets mm -hmm. that will make you good at anything. Yeah. And this career has afforded you that right for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's even like interesting to think of like some of the most successful realtors in our industry we're just super successful people in whatever industry they were in before. That's right. right. I would say it at my old office. I'd say, take everybody in this office yeah. and turn this into a tennis facility. You think the same people will be at the top of the charts there kicking each other's ass at tennis? They will. Yeah. It doesn't matter what yeah. it is. Yeah. So what is it that makes someone competitive? What is it that makes them successful? Yeah. What is it that makes them rise to the top of anything? The only thing that that matters in regards to wealth is that you have more than your neighbor. Mm. That's how wealth is measured. Mm. We don't care otherwise. As yeah. long as you have more than them, yeah. you're fine. So if I'm competing against people always, how am I going to win? Yeah, it's true. So question, because you always just tell me this when I get crazy after appointments sometimes. You said if it's meant to be, it'll be yours. Well, I mean, yeah. listen, smart people have said this to me at some point. I didn't come yeah. up with this crap. Mm -hmm. The way I like to say it, when I'm speaking it, I say everything I have is mine, mm. and I and I mean that. So the but when, so I, I have four kids, right? Mm -hmm. I have a 12 year old son, and he's starting to date for a child that's 12 years old, right? And we're talking about all the opportunity that they have in their life, mm -hmm. and they think that the things that they're dealing with now are relevant. Mm -hmm. Like I'm 12 years old. And this girl's kind of a problem and this is happening and math is hard and I didn't do great at basketball and life seems like this. If you look at that child, you're thinking, do you know where you're going to go in your life? Do you know the people right. you're going to meet? You know the things that you're going to see? And who are you going to be when you get there? Are you going to be the person that does what they say they're going to do, reads the book when they're assigned, follows up and does everything necessary in order to live a good life and be mm -hmm. prepared for that opportunity? 
And that's what it's like talking to a real estate agent who's like, well, how am I going to get to 37 deals? Well, you could get to 37 deals, but who are you? Mm, what yeah. are you even doing with your life? Yeah. Yeah. It's more important because there's no structure when it comes to real estate at all. Yeah. And you literally have people that could stumble into some success with no longevity. So you want to plan for longevity? Be somebody. Yeah. Mm. They hit home. That's good. So I view companies and agents the same. Okay. Right? Because you really are a company these days. If you're going to be a team leader, then you own a company. Yeah. Because you don't have anybody else that's going to solve those problems for you. So you're a company, right? Yeah. So now that you have a company, you're going to retrain and recruit agents and try to keep them, try to retain them to the company. What are you providing? And just like we were talking about as an individual, you're figuring out who you want to become. What do you want the company to be? Mm. I told you earlier that I had a, a part or a time in my company that I realized that we weren't solving problems at a level that I was proud of. Every single person at the company at that time didn't represent the service that I was trying to give. Well, so that has to be changed. So who do you want to be as a person is also who do you want to be as a company and as a solution? If you're just looking for the lowest split and the lowest commission, mm. can you be angry when the consumer does the same thing? Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, that's true. That, that makes sense. So how do you differentiate yourself? And then in terms of how do you, how do you structure it in terms of making the organization actual profitable? So profit's a whole different thing, right? Mm -hmm. People are not even considering how to make profit anymore. That's not even part of their business model. Their model is, can I do enough deals where they can have a balloon and champagne at my closing, Yeah. right? Or can I post a number at the end of the year and be a big deal in my office? And that's what people are trying to figure out. So your question was what? How do I actually do a good job? How do I add value? What? <laughs> Yeah. Well, so then how do you train them? How do you retain them? How do you recruit them? How do you okay. build off of that? So it's core values. Mm -hmm. So like we went, the example, if you're running the company in this building, right? It's going to be driven by core values. Most people write a business plan and they decide that, well, we're supposed to have core values. So let's be integrity and honesty. Those are sound good, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do people at your company get fired when they're not honest? Well, if they're not, they're not living the core values. Yeah. So this is where core values actually drive decisions. So from a recruiting standpoint, we bring a recruit in, we have nine core values, and I'm gonna ask questions in line with those core values and determine if you actually Are at aligned. least can pretend for long enough that you're in line with those, and I'm gonna monitor those. Mm. Out of the nine core values, three of them, if you violate them, you're immediately terminated. Do you actually run the company with the what core values in mind? You guys? Trustworthiness is key, yeah. transparency, and coachability. Hmm. Those are three that if you're not those things, I'm going to have to ask you to leave today. There's other ones like diligence, relentlessness. We can train those over time. If you don't have them, we'll help you with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you don't have integrity and you're not honest about the transaction and you yeah. don't provide transparency, you don't work here. I can't teach you that. And I shouldn't have to teach you that. When we were taking EOS, right? Yeah. We had to write down our core values. He was like, I don't get this exercise. Yeah. He's no. like, what it's does cheesy. this Well, do? people treat it cheesy. It's not that I didn't get it. It's He's like, I get it, but why do we have to do it? No, I don't <laughs> think, that wasn't my thought. I think I, at times I felt like we were trying to take somebody else's and yeah. mold them to be ours. And yeah, it's not that's that how I it feels. It's not that I didn't understand the exercise. It's that I didn't want to just copy somebody else's. One of our core values is lighthearted. Mm. Right. Yeah. And we would go through these core values and I, and we had different renditions of them. And I would tell the agents, here's our core values, <clears throat> honesty, integrity. And they're like, okay, nobody. And it's like, it didn't hit. Right. Yeah. It, you feel like you're borrowing someone's yeah. and you do borrow someone's until they become, but then you keep working on it and then you actually recruit to it. And then you call people out and say, you're here mm. because of these traits. Yeah. You're coachable. Yeah. You're a team player. Yeah. Mm. yeah. You're transparent during the transaction. Those are the things, those are the reasons you're here. Now they start to become alive. Then when someone violates it, I fire them and slaughter them like a lamb. Yeah. <laughs> and then I come back and, and say, and that rest... is why they're gone and why you're here. Now mm. core values actually mean something, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Lightheartedness. We arrived at that because if you don't have a sense of humor, I have nothing for you. Yeah. Why are you here? Yeah. Right? Yeah, in this business, of course. Yeah. yeah. 
We argued for about an hour about humbly confident. I, I couldn't remember which one it was. You were thinking about it? <laughs> Carol fought so hard for that. Uh, Did you stick with humbly confident? I took humbly confident. I, I, I threw it out the window. That's like the soft the heart. I don't know what to do with that. It's, it's soft heart. No, it's <laughs> that's messy right there. Like think it's about messy. it. It's he, messy. He's confident in his abilities, but he's very humble with everybody. He doesn't think the ego never takes place. And that's what makes him mm. so coachable. And like he can think that he's not so good that he can still learn from his coaches. So do you want humble people that work for you? Confident people without ego. With no ego? Yeah. Really? But you need an ego to a certain level. You need a certain level of narcissism in a salesperson for them to actually be successful. What is ego? Ego is the, the thing in your mind that says I'm better than anybody else. Okay. And what, so how is that different than confidence? Confidence is your ability. You believe it's in your coaching ability. coaching right now on the spot. Yeah. No, you believe in your capabilities to achieve something. Yeah. It's not personal. It's in your abilities. Like if I'm lifting. So let's tighten it up. Okay. Ego is the words and the way that you speak to yourself about yourself. Mm. Some people are not telling themselves the truth. Mm. Right. And when the ego is most apparent to other people is when there's no alignment there. Right. So you've convinced yourself that you've solved problems and achieved things that you haven't. And that's mm. when ego's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Confidence, I believe, is actually a track record of winning mm -hmm. because you can't have confidence without winning and you can't, you can't maintain it over time unless you have a Proof pattern of, concept, yeah. of winning. So can you have confidence without a track record? You can have good intentions. If you have confidence, mm. then it would be called, what, false confidence? Fake it till you make it? Yeah. Is that what people say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's fake it till you make it. I think that it's do your best until you make it. Mm -hmm. And it's try and try again. Yeah. But fake it until you make it is really, that is the ego. That is, mm -hmm. that's what we experience in our business is people that come out and think that they're on your level the day one that they start yeah. in this business. Or they did one deal, yeah. The day they start, they think, well, I have a real estate license, so you and me are equals, and therefore everything that you've done is the same as what I've done. Yeah. It's the most ridiculous thought. Yeah. It's well, that's so, entitlement, essentially. It is entitlement, yeah. 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 But confidence only comes from winning over, over a long period of time. Look at the people that win. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of people that win, I feel like are humbly confident to, an, to a degree. <laughs> so then let's add this. So humility, yeah. my belief is that humility is when you walk in the room and everybody knows exactly who the fuck you are and you don't have to say it. Yes, but humility by definition but is- But wait thinking, a minute, but wait sorry. a minute. But humility is, mm -hmm. you know who I am. Okay. Because I've achieved something. True. I don't have to say it. Okay. So if Derek Jeter walks in right now. Fair. He's not going to say, I'm humble. Derek Jeter. Is he humble? Yeah, he's humble because, holy shit, that's Derek Jeter, right? right. Holy shit. Is that humility? No, he doesn't have mm. to say it because the whole world says it for him. Yeah. Fair. Fair. Okay. So then we're- I just felt like I had to attack you. And then, like, you yeah. weren't even challenging. I, I, I wasn't, like I but I'm, I'm just going to say humility by definition is thinking less of yourself, not thinking you're less worthy, but thinking about yourself less than the people around you that was close to it it was humility is not thinking less of yourself it's, it's thinking of yourself less yeah yeah amen so we have the core values of an organization yes so when you have the core values now you're ready to build and you're you're putting the and right higher, people in higher the right based seats. on them yeah so now the second step is going to be what right people right seats or what would be the next step next step is going to be are you actually doing what you tell people to do so mm. now we have core values. Do you live those core values? Do you embody those core values? I tell everybody they need to be at work every day by 8.30. What time do you come in? Mm. Well, sometimes I have stuff. I have closings. I have this. I have that. I have to run the company, right? So no, you don't. No, you don't. You have an obligation to live what you intend for them to do. If you don't do that, then they don't respect you. Right. At least to a certain level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a level that I haven't experienced yet. No, that makes a lot of sense. Because like so many times, like it's hard to stay committed to like that role play schedule of being in the office at 7.30 in the morning. Sometimes those are days that you don't be there, but then everybody else slacks that same exact day. Of course. And it's like, literally, it's like, all right, shit, now I have to restart it all over again, but now I have to do it twice as intense because then like, and you have to openly apologize about it. Like, oh, my, my apologies, whatever. Never apologize. Never, okay, yeah. No, thank no. them. Okay, thank you for your patience. Never say I'm sorry. That's a, that's a problem I have. When somebody walks through the door, I'm like, oh, sorry. Yes, you do. And like, if you're talking to someone on the phone and you call them and it's too early and they say, it's too early, you say, I'm sorry about that. 
No, no. You don't do that? I say, my apologies. You're speaking with an agent. I'm saying, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, okay. Fine. Apologies. Yeah, no, mm. you don't do that. Mm. Thank them. Thank you for taking my call. Thank you for waiting. So you call me at 7.30, I'm an expired. Yeah. Quick role play? Yeah. All right. Who, who is this at 7.30? This is Why David with Van Noy Real Estate. Mm -hmm. I'm Why, calling about so the house early. that came off the market. Did Why you, is it early? Did you check the time? Do you know what time it is? I checked the time and it's time to get this house sold. What time do you want to meet? <laughs> It's two, call me in an hour. Well, normally they're going to say, you called me mm -hmm. and I don't like it, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So tell me that you don't like that. I, I woke I, you I, up at 7.30. I don't appreciate that you calling me at 7.30. Well, anymore. I got two options. I can sit here and do nothing and wait till the other real estate agents get out of bed at 9.30 or I can call you now to set the appointment. Mm -hmm. So would you like to do it now? That's a tough one to, to go back from, yeah. <laughs> but that was the difference in the power versus force part because it was a lot of the times I was so stuck to like, well, if this, would you do this? If this, would you do this? And it was like forcing it down I do there. notice this, not with you, but with, you know, we're training some of these newer salespeople and going through role plays and stuff like this, right? And you, maybe it's a Jersey thing too, especially because the retort that I hear is like, well, let me ask you this, Quinn. Let oh, me ask you this. Well, let me, well, what if I were to do this? Well, what if I were to throw in an extra squeegee at the end? Like it's, I mean. Yeah. That's, that's how rapport is completely lost, Yeah. right? So when a prospecting call happens, we do this training in my office where we actually listen to some of the calls. Mm -hmm. And here's what you're gonna recognize about a call. If I make a call to a prospect, the first thing that anybody is gonna say if they listen to one of my calls is, it really feels like you know that person. Mm. Are you guys friends? So how do you approach- Are you from Jordan? Are you from- <laughs> 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 I was born and raised in Jordan. <laughs> Yeah. See, Bobby. <laughs> like, well, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, have, I don't even know how to make a joke about Jordan. <laughs> so if you listen to it, though, they say, you knew that guy, right? Mm -hmm. and I don't know that guy. I just called him. Hey, what's going on, Bobby? Bobby, I'm calling about the house, right? It's levity. Yeah. Right? It's levity that they're not bringing to the call because it's monotonous or it's boring or they're nervous whatever it is, there's no playfulness about it at all. Yeah. Yeah. And they yeah. lose it. I think you have to make it fun for two reasons. A, to create the relationship, the levity, like you said, and B, to just keep yourself sane, right? Yeah. Like if you don't make what you're doing fun, like having the playfulness of those calls and being so tied to the outcome of like, oh my God, yeah. I have to set this appointment. You, you have to do it for yourself too. Like, yeah, you know? I watched one of my friends, Lee Marcus in Chicago. Yeah great friend and a great guy. And I was watching him prospect when I was in Roscoe Village with him one time. And I don't know if I've ever told him this, but I was listening to him prospect to people and get rejected and get turned down and get everything that happens. And he knows a lot of people in this marketplace. He works a very small community and yeah. has a, a high market share. And he's still very jovial about the next call. And what I recognize and I observed there that I've taken away and I consider a lot, is your ability to do this job at a high level and maintain the ability not to create a heavy heart, yeah. not to create any jadedness, and still believe that the next person that answers is going to receive the help that you're trying to give them, it's everything. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the playful confidence that like, you have on those calls is a big, big thing too. Right, so it's like being playfully confident. Like you're, they come back, say something. Well, you're playful and you're confident in the approach that you take. And that yeah, we liken it, it yeah. to the game. We liken it to yeah. like yeah. it's like it's flirting or, or flirting. Or, it's or, absolutely or flirting. Being on a first date. Yeah, like, you know, you have to sort of. What's the girl's name that works here? What's Alea? Uh, Alea. Alea. Did she leave? I think so. I think she. She left. Not because <laughs> of you. Or anything. Not because. Not because of, of your no, playful no. confidence. Okay. <laughs> Do you need anything? No, no, no. Oh. I was flirting with her when I, I mean, that yeah. was flirting, right? Yeah. It's nothing. It's, it's, yeah. in, but that was fun. I was flirting yeah. with the old ladies at lunch today, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I gave one of them a hug. I gave yeah. her my business card. I, that's, yeah. that's the playful. But you make that, that memorable experience for somebody. And that's what that sales is, right? That's it. So Th that's a big piece. I mean, she's going to go home and tell her girlfriends, oh, this guy in the, the restaurant gave me his card and like, whatever. Yeah. I'm not dick riding on Ryan Serhan, but he did say people like don't like to be sold to. They like to shop with friends. We haven't talked about him at all. Why did you go immediately to uh, dick riding? I'm yeah. sorry. I, well, it's, I didn't want to jump on the bandwagon. It makes but me think that you are dick riding. I was, <laughs> I was, I was, the, the quote came in my mind. And Maybe I just, dry humping. <laughs> go ahead. Tell me. This is where we wrap everything up. Give me the meat. <laughs>